Um, so thank you everybody for joining us today for this SciDevNet debate. Um, my name is Fiona Broom. I'm the Deputy Editor for Features and Investigations uh, for SciDevNet, which is the world's leading source of news and analysis about science for global development. Um, as many of you will know, two weeks ago, the United States Supreme Court passed down a decision which eliminated the federal standard that protected the right to abortion. Um, the United States High Commissioner, uh, sorry, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, responded to this by saying that the decision was a major setback uh, after more than 50 countries uh, with previously restrictive laws had liberalized their abortion legislation in the past 25 years. Um, since the Supreme Court decision was leaked back in May, global health advocates have questions whether it will have worldwide implications. Uh, one major concern is that US lawmakers could now take steps to block federal funding to non-US health organizations that provide abortion services or abortion information. Um, so today we'll consider the status of sexual and reproductive health rights in the developing world and whether changes to laws in the US will have a cooling effect on donor funding for health services. Uh, and we'll also take the opportunity to examine the status of reproductive health campaigns across the global south. Um, uh, we've got loads to get through today, so let's get straight into it. Uh, on the panel, we have Sarah Hawks. Sarah is the co-founder and co-director of Global Health 5050, an independent research initiative focusing on gender equality and health equity. Um, she has lived and worked for much of the past 20 years in Asia. Uh, Rasha Khoury has just joined us. Rasha is a Palestinian obstetrician gynecologist. She's currently an assistant professor of medicine at Boston University and a board member of Doctors Without Borders USA. Um, Catalina Calderon is responsible for advocacy strategies and implementation processes in Latin America and the Caribbean for the Women's Equality Center. Marlene Temmerman is a professor of obstetrics and gynecology. Among many roles, Marlene is the director of the Center of Excellence in Women and Child Health at Aga Khan University, East Africa. Rajiv Acharya is a demographer and public health specialist. He's currently a senior associate with the Population Council, which is an international nonprofit that conducts research in biomedicine, social science, and public health. Martin Onyango is a senior legal advisor for the Center for Reproductive Rights Africa program. Um, Martin is responsible for spearheading litigation in Kenya and supporting program strategy on litigation and related advocacy. And finally, Rebecca Dennis is associate, uh, sorry, associate director of US policy and advocacy at PAI, which is the Population Action International. Um, Rebecca is an advocate for international family planning and reproductive health funding, legislation and policy, and works with uh, members of the US Congress to secure access to these services. So some of the fears about how the Supreme Court's decision could impact funding is based on what's known as the global gag rule. Um, Rebecca is going to help us unpack this policy uh, and understand how it might influence new policies. Um, Rebecca, let's just start with a really simple question. What is the global gag rule? Great, thanks so much, Fiona. Um, it's great to be here with you all this morning. Um, so the global gag rule is really a policy by the United States that's become very notorious over the years for the damage that it causes to health systems. Um, the global gag rule is essentially a policy put in place by the president of the United States that says that a non-US NGO um, in order to remain eligible to receive funding from the United States has to agree to not provide any information, counseling, referrals, or advocate for the legalization of abortion with actually their own funding. Um, so this goes above and beyond sort of the normal policies that we might see around what an organization can do with donor funds. This tells them what they can do with other donors funding. And over the years, this policy has been put in place by every Republican president since 1984 under the Reagan administration, um, and then promptly removed, usually within the first couple of days a president, a Democratic president is in office. So uh, just to be very clear, the global gag rule is currently not um, in effect, and I'm happy to go into some of the 
ways that um, we've seen politicians try to either permanently put this policy in place or, or permanently remove it um, so that we don't have to worry about this flip-flop that happens every four to eight years, depending on who's in the White House. Are there any legal mechanisms for it to be re-implemented um, under the current president? Or is there any possibility that a policy or legislation that funks in, functions in a similar fashion um, could potentially be implemented by Congress, which, uh, which would um, serve the same purpose of, of blocking funding for um, reproductive health services? Yeah, so this is a fight that we have pretty much yearly in the United States with Congress. Um, there are efforts pretty much every year to attach the global gag rule to um, our funding bills in the US where we determine how much money we're going to put towards foreign assistance. Um, and there are also a number of bills that have been introduced by anti-reproductive health um, members of Congress who seek to permanently put this policy into place or, or similar policies um, into place or attach it to other pieces of legislation. So this is something that we're constantly watching and working against. And one of the ways that we do that is by countering it through working with um, pro-sexual and reproductive health and rights champions in Congress who have introduced legislation known as the Global Gag Rule or uh, known as the Global Her Act, the Global Health Empowerment and Rights Act, um, which would go ahead and take this policy out of the hands of the president um, and permanently repeal it by preventing a former uh, future president from taking these actions again in the future. Um, and We've also seen efforts in the annual funding bills in the US by our champions to take the language from that legislation and include it there um, as just another avenue to try and get something passed. And we've seen that be relatively successful um, in the US House of Representatives. They actually did pass a spending bill last year that included that permanent repeal um, of the global gag rule language. Unfortunately, in our system, we need both the House of Representatives and the Senate to be on board with something in order for it to pass and actually become law. Um, that did not happen in the Senate last year. Um, so that was a bit of a step back, um, but is something that we're continuing to try and do so that we can end this policy once and for all. Why is it significant? Why is this policy significant? How does it impact on access, not just to sexual and reproductive health services, but to health services uh, in general, in communities um, across the global south, uh, and, and and why is it significant if the U.S. stops funding these services? Yeah, so it's a really good and important question, and actually gets in a lot to um, the history of this policy. So, for many decades, when it was in place, the policy explicitly only impacted uh, family planning and reproductive health programs. So although it had a very severe impact by cutting off many of the most trusted providers of those services in communities around the world who were unwilling to set aside um, their values around ensuring that their clients had access to comprehensive reproductive health care um, in order to continue to receive US funding, um, it was somewhat limited in the scope uh, in terms of what what portions of the health sector it could impact. Um, under the Trump administration, we saw a massive expansion of this policy and it then was changed to tie to all US global health assistance. So it went from impacting about a little over $600 million worth of funding coming from the United States to over $8 billion worth of funding coming from the United States. So obviously a massive increase in the impact across um, the sector. And what we ended up seeing was those negative impacts on the reproductive health sector in terms of shutting down clinics, clinics having to limit services that they had available, um, issues around supply chain for, health clinics to be able to get 
um, actually the products that they needed, the breakdown in referral networks in communities or advocacy networks in communities was really just amplified across then the entire health sector, um, which was a really particularly problematic thing to see um, as we headed into what has obviously now been years of a global pandemic. Um, this policy really had the effect of weakening many health systems around the world um, right before we went into a massive global health crisis. Um, and you mentioned there some of the work that's being done to um reverse or um, remove this this policy. Uh, is that something that you think is likely to be successful in the future or what's what's the kind of the current status of that battle? Yeah, um, it's something that we are um, actually ourselves very interested in seeing what the impacts of the recent Supreme Court decision that you mentioned up front um, will have on our advocacy efforts around this. Um, on the one hand, there is very much a concern that that could lead to really bolstering the efforts of the anti-reproductive health community in terms of them trying to push for this policy to be permanently put in place. But we've also seen that it's very much energized the uh, pro-sexual and reproductive health community as well, including members of Congress. So one of the things that we've been really attempting to emphasize is the impact that a decision like this coming from the Supreme Court can have um, both legally and just in terms of the rhetoric around sexual and reproductive health and rights across the entire global community. So this is not the time to step back from focusing on um, how the US is showing up globally around sexual and reproductive health and rights. So we're really using that to try to continue to build support for permanently removing the global gag rule. Um, the House of Representatives, again, just in, passed um, out of a committee, which is sort of the first step in moving a piece of legislation or a funding bill along um, towards passage, a bill that included a permanent repeal of this policy. So we're again trying to see if this is an avenue that we can use to um, remove this policy for good. Um, so now we'll start to turn our attention to the Senate and see if we can similarly build up the momentum there to um, see this policy removed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, Sarah and Marlene, I'll I'll turn to you now. Uh, in February, uh, SlideDevNet reported that donor funding for family planning in 59 low and middle income countries um, had declined by more than $100 million in 2020, which I, I guess is a something of a drop in the ocean when we we're talking about about $8 billion coming from um, the, new, the US. Um, but this drop was largely due to UK overseas aid cuts. Um, so Let's discuss what's the current status of international donor funding for sexual and reproductive health services in the Global South. And do many of these services really rely on um, international support? Um, Sarah, let's begin with you. Uh, thank you, Fiona. So my understanding is, well, first of all, uh, it completely aligns with yours that a large part of that uh, decrease in um, money going to family planning and contraceptive services was as a direct result of the, um, the, the cut, the significant cut in UK aid. And that, that cut is due to... Um, to carry on for a number of years until quote unquote the UK is in a more stable economic position, which we can all hazard a guess as to when that might be. Um, but the, I think what you know when it comes to other other external development assistance funders of sexual and reproductive health services. My, I mean, I, I'm not aware that the uh, that there's been a really significant um, and very specific analysis 
of what the data looks like right now. Um, I think that you know what what we've seen is a combination of um, one country cutting its funding due to an economic crisis and then a potential diversion of funding due to to COVID. But from the data that is publicly available right now at sort of aggregate global level, I don't, from my perspective, Marlene might know much better than me. I'm not sure that we can really put our finger on the question of whether funding to family planning in particular has actually decreased. What we do have is better data or better evidence from, from countries as to whether or not they prioritized sexual and reproductive health, health services as part of the essential package of services that all health systems were signed up to deliver during the pandemic. And that, that's a bit of a mixed picture. I mean, that, that varies from country to country and setting to setting. There, there's no sort of one overall um, picture there, except that, I mean, the, the work from WHO Afro in 2020, for example, so the African region showed that the majority of countries did include um, SRH as part of the essential package of services. But then, of course, what you're asking is the question of who's actually funding it and whether uh, development assistance for that has, has declined. And I think it will take us a little bit more time um, to, to answer that. As I say, unless Marlene, who is much closer to, to the action than, than me, the economic action would be able to, to tell us. Thank you. Yes, thanks and a good afternoon. And good morning, everyone. Yeah, I agree with Sarah, it's a bit a mixed picture, but coming back to the um, implications of the global gag rule, I think I can say that we we felt it in the first, before the Trump global gag rule, we felt it very, very clearly that US um, uh, investments were going down and under Trump administration even, even much more. So that had a direct impact here in Kenya Mozambique, Uganda, Tanzania, on funding of a number of uh, NGOs, uh, global partners. So we, we the, I'm, 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 I agree that there is no kind of um, one one single action, but there are indicators and there are studies showing that because of problems with access to uh, family planning, also maternal health, maternal mortality. Uh, kind of seem to be impacted. Uh, of course, there has been a response. Um, the global GAC rule has led them to a massive response from other countries. IPPF has kind of raised on, on, on the previous global GAC rule. Now it was the She Decides movement that has tried to compensate with uh, funding from, from Europe and other countries, but it never met, of course, the big, big short, I mean, the, the shortfall. So there has been action and reaction um, on the pure economic side. I think what is even worse, as uh, it was already alluded to, is that due to all this, to the, the decrease of the funding, the open um, pushback to the global, to the agenda of the ICPD uh, 1994 and the program of action, that the opposition has been you know, kind of felt supported and has grown tremendously. We see an enormous pushback to the, the agenda that was agreed on in Beijing in 1995, and that still needs to be uh, uh, implemented in many countries. And another point I want to make is that because of funding going to, to and it's always difficult, and there's always priorities, but in, in the 80s, 90s, there was HIV, then SRHR, and we have seen a kind of horrendous neglect during 20 years of family planning on sich. Uh, it was kind of dissolved also in the big basket of SRHR, but family planning itself kind of was diluted. And thanks to the FP 2020 and the summit we had in London in 2012, um, the, the global community and governments and the UN and, and uh, foundations like the Gates Foundation have invested seriously in, um, in family planning. And I think we have a bit of a revival. And then with, with uh, COVID, <laughs> it was again a financial pushback, of course, because we had 
ODA funding and other resources um, were kind of in competition. So it is, um, well, my, my, main, my main lesson actually is besides the economic uh, challenges that family planning programs and SRHR um, uh, groups have that we have to organize ourselves much better uh, with Roe Ro v. Wade so many years ago and also in Europe some progress made. We had the impression that we, we really had gained a lot in SRHR, and we did in some parts of the world, but we underestimate the pushback, the money that is there, and also the organizational capacity of our opponents. Um, so I'm going to stop here, but this is really, for me, the major concern here in the field. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marlene. Um, Sarah, I'll take it back to a kind of a core question here as well. Um, we're talking about um, reductions in, in family planning uh, services, in sexual reproductive health services. What's at stake for communities um, when these services are cut back? What can be the impact at the, at the personal level, at the family level, at the community level? I wouldn't be alone in thinking that, that the entire structure of who we are as individuals, as families, as communities, as societies is at stake if people are not able to realise the right to their own bodily autonomy. If you're not able to make decisions for yourself uh, um, and, and realise those decisions actively about um, who you have sex with, when you have sex, what kind of sex, whether or not you want that sex to result in a, a, a pregnancy, whether you want that, to, that pregnancy to carry to, through to term, whether you are then enabled to bring that child into, a, in, into the world and support that child. I mean, remembering that the responsibility of individuals, families, societies, public policy doesn't just end at the moment that, uh, that a woman gives birth. I mean, you could argue it you know, from a reproductive justice perspective, it very much that's, a start, that's, that's almost a starting point, not, not an end point as it's often talked about. So we're talking about the fundamentals of who we are as, as, as individuals. It's about our right to realise our own bodily autonomy and make decisions for ourselves about who we are as sexually reproducing beings. And the implications of that, you know, go across the board. I think in some ways, the question, in particularly around financing, the, the ability to realize those decisions for each of us as individuals. I mean, I, I, I would urge a, a discussion that really situates the, the question of financing beyond the responsibilities of one country. I mean, I think that, that what we're talking about, to be honest with you, is, is a situation that we've got ourselves into because we, A, have relied on an incredibly old model that was developed back in the 1920s of how particularly population control programs, which is the origin of what we're talking about, was financed. And you know, we could have another panel on the, the origins of that as a as, as a, a um, as a global mechanism. And you know, that has carried on. And here we are a hundred years later with, a, with a, a model developed in a completely different era and time, but still with the, the, the direction of travel dictated particularly by one country and the vagaries and the, the, you know, the, the nuances of what happens within that one country. Because what we haven't done is shared the responsibility particularly within the countries that, pe that, that, that people live, operate, work within. You know, so it, yes, we can all, I, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm very much an advocate for, for social economic justice at a global level, but I do think we should also be talking about what the countries themselves are funding and their responsibility, because it's the citizens that, of those countries that can hold their own governments to account as to who's actually supposed to be funding the services that enable all of us to realize our, our, our autonomous bodily rights. Thank you, Sarah. 
Um, Marlene, I'll just go back to quickly to something that you had mentioned. You said that um, even before this decision from the US Supreme Court that you had seen that opposition was growing. Um, just in, the, in a couple of minutes, uh, where is this opposition coming from and, and sort of what do you attribute um, the growth to? Oh, I think uh, the opposition is coming from um, um, nationalistic um, religious uh, groups who are getting better, better organized. We see a number of um, governments also in, in Europe, for example, who are getting together and opposing women's rights and women agencies and reproductive health and rights more and more. Uh, and, and that is not something new. I mean, uh, the, the fight for uh, legalization or de decriminalization of abortion has been going on in many, many countries. What we currently see here, at least in Kenya and in African countries, is there is um, the, the churches, the evangelistic churches, they are getting more and more powerful. And I agree with what Fiona was saying, that it's the countries themselves who have to take also their responsibility. But look at a country like Kenya, where the, the constitution is quite progressive. And the Ministry of Health, there is some debate there, but uh, basically the implementation of family planning, you can have a, a, a lot of nice resolutions and guidelines, but it's at the county level, it's the evolved system. So there it depends on the, the, the governance of that particular area. So it's, it's very difficult for some areas where govern, uh, governments are more conservative, where they want to have a lot of children, where the religious factors um, are keeping women away from their own uh, agency and decision power. I mean, that's, that's, that's really the reality here on the field. And just maybe one more thing on the, um, I think we have to think how to organize ourselves better, not to be dependent that much of the, of the US, but there is a uh, parliament and we have, I, I used to be a parliamentarian and we had a very strong uh, standing committee at the Interparliamentarian Union that is bringing all parliaments from all countries together. Uh, with the necessary efforts, we can have this debate at the level of the IPU, um, which we did in with, for HIV, for, um, for some other programs. So we, we could try to look to work through our parliaments and having that, that, uh, that structure kind of revitalized mm -hmm. for family planning and reproductive health. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, so Marlene, you just mentioned there that um, this uh, opposition and um, campaigns around access uh, are not new and that they are global. Um, we're lucky today that we've got uh, uh, experts from around the world joining us. Um, so let's now hear from some of our community law and health experts to, what, to find out what's happening um, in regions around the world. Um, Catalina, let's begin with you. There's been the green wave of campaigns across Latin America in the past few years, um, which has had varying degrees of success. Um, I understand that Argentina recently passed legislation to legalize abortion, um, but in some other countries like El Salvador, uh, there have been cases where uh, women have been jailed for murder after having miscarriages. Um, I, I read a quote from an attorney recently who said that there's real solidarity across countries in Latin America. Um, and strategy sharing. And she said that victories in one country in the region inspire um, victories in other countries. Um, but is it also the case then that losses um, such as that in the US uh, can also embolden opponents? Thank you, Fiona. Um, yes, uh, just to give you a short answer, what happened with the Dobbs decision is, 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 is to worry, not only for the US, but for Latin America as well. Um, as for the past, let's say, um, probably 20 years or more, uh, Latin American countries in their advocacy efforts to actually change uh, laws um, or regulations of any kind have always uh, put arguments that were set on the row uh, way decision in order to actually push for uh, decision-making change here in Latin America. We have to look at the region in like for this specific issue divided in three in three uh, big groups. 
fact, you know, the countries that have structural abortion bans, we have five countries uh, on those, El Salvador being one of them, as you mentioned. But between those five countries, we also have one that has a ban on emergency contraception, and that is Honduras. And Honduras is one of the countries with the most, um, uh, the highest numbers of uh, sexual violence in the region. So that is something that we, that, that, is, that is preposterous. And, and to be honest, I'm going back to Marlene's point, um, it has to be one of the, of, of, of the biggest wins of the position in the region. And uh, it's putting girls, specifically girls and uh, young girls, you know, like in poverty uh, conditions at risk every single day. Then we have the countries to have um, exemptions uh, either for life and health, for rape or incest exceptions, economic exemptions, we have, we have those. And then we have the most recent countries who have moved forward either to um, decriminalize by um, uh, age limit gestation or to send the mandate to a uh, state legislature to lift the ban, saying total abortion bans are unconstitutional. That is the case of Mexico. In Argentina, uh, it was a change um, of regulation up until uh, week 14. Then in Colombia recently, uh, it was February this year, the constitutional court said it was unconstitutional to criminalize abortion up until uh, week 24. Mm. Other than that, Uruguay also has a progressive law. Other than that, we have exemptions all over the region. Um, and what is going on right now is that exemptions have been proven that they are not sufficient because it brings a lot first of a stigma to the, to the abortion itself. It's very hard to fight the stigma because then again, it's still a felony. It is still a crime. You know, there are just few situations that say, if you are under this situation, then fine. You're not, we're not gonna send you to jail, but still it's a crime. Um, and then second of all, it's very hard uh, for uh, our medical professionals, not, not, not that specifically are like, providers for uh, sexual reproductive health, but in the rural areas where just like a doctor for a whole population to understand that the, the, you know, like the, the, the nuances of the law. The, we're your health professional, you're here to save life. You're here to support a person's health uh, services, not to be a lawyer, right? So therefore it's like, what am I allowed to do? What I'm not allowed to do? So it, end, it ends up being that liability, you know, like considerations come into place for a medical professional to actually, you know, like support a women's decision um, or a women's situation, you know, when we have exemptions. And we have seen this over and over again uh, in the region. So um, as for how the, the feminist groups and activism through the Green Wave have supported each other, I think in many ways. Uh, first of all, inspiration. What we saw in Argentina from 20, let's call it, probably 16 up until 2020, when the law got approved uh, by Congress was immense. It was a call out that this is enough. My body is not yours to decide over. I decide over that and a lot, and, and this call to action came from women from all other ages, came from men ally, came from a uh, trans uh, uh, community, came from the LGBTQ plus community, it came from, from a lot, a big group. That it doesn't mean you're just like an activist, you have been here forever. Uh, the green handkerchief became a symbol that we are in this for the long run. You can still see the people wearing your hand, the green handkerchief saying, you know, I am part of this and this is my body and you don't have the right to, to make decisions over me. It was a very, very, very strict and, you know, some may call it even radical, which, you know, but I, I don't think so just to say, you know, you don't hold power over me. You know, I am the one making these decisions. I know what's the best for me. Then this green wave have moved across the region. Uh, and now we're seeing in the United States, very like, you know, like super happy to see it in the United States. Um, that actually is, uh, it's moving towards the, the to, towards the, that same call to action, you know, even in the countries that have exemptions to the countries that have total abortion bans, you know, this is the call to action. Governments should not be the ones holding this decision over. And who governments? Decision makers. If it's a Republican uh, president in the United States, as a Latin American countries, then we have to deal with the global cargo. It was horrible what happened here in the region for funding receiving 
during the Trump era. Uh, and it's, it's because of that, it's, it's, it's very hard for health uh, practitioners, but also for um, civil society organizations to actually have funding in order to move forward and support this cause. And opposition is being brutal, to be honest. So in any case, um, we have countries such as Mexico, that uh, Supreme Court in Mexico said, look, it's up to the states, yes, but I am sending a call to action to the state legislatures that you need to lift your abortion bans, decriminalize abortion because that is unconstitutional. So now what you have been seeing is state by state changing their, uh, their, uh, their penal codes and saying, look, up until 12, 14 weeks, you know, more, the, the highest has been 13 so far. Um, to leave the code, but then you see all these movements coming together on this understanding, like what were the best practices, you know, from Argentina to Mexico. How do you see who's your decision maker? How do you plan to have uh, messages crafted for specific audiences? Uh, how do you mobilize? Because you need to mobilize. You know, it's very hard to push uh, for change when you have an like you know like a very conservative uh, decision maker in the room. But it's harder when you have a progressive one because it's you know she or he might be your ally right but still they're being you know pressured by churches um by evangelical groups but you know far right wing um um you know like stakeholders so in any case you need to even push harder when are your allies and we saw that in argentina president fernandez who uh is an ally to, to, to this cause it was very hard. It wasn't like, you know, like he got into office and then COVID hit, right? And then he had other uh, priorities. So the women still say like, no, you don't have, a, we are your priority as well. This is a priority. Women and girls are dying. Women and girls health are, are, are you know, are, are, are like suffering. So this is a priority as well, but that requires a push. And it's very hard to push your ally, very, very hard. So we, I think one of the big learnings of the past few years is that we, the, the women's and uh, people who can get pregnant movement, we need to keep pushing every single day. This is going to be an ongoing fight, I think, for the rest of our lives. And Dobbs' decision has proved it. And I think has sent that message here to Latin America that we cannot give this thing for granted. For instance, impact um, on Monday, a very respectable journalist uh, in Mexico uh, put up an, 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 uh, an op-ed stating that he knew for a fact that the uh, Mexican president was actually inquiring what was the decision-making processes, what were the arguments by uh, Justice Alito in the Dobbs decision, therefore can the Mexican decision be reversed? You know, it's like those things, you know, those conversations that are happening, can we go back? Because Roe was 50, 49 years, you know, Mexican decision is, 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 is a year, year and a half. So can we do it, right? Uh, then uh, here in Colombia as well, we have the decision in February 21, and now you see this group of fundamentalists uh, getting signatures in order to uh, go to the, um, to, to send for a vote to cancel that decision and to put a constitutional ban on abortion, emergency contraception, IBF and make discrimination as a, as, a, as a fundamental right. And that is preposterous. And of course, that is the hit back from Dobbs because they're using the arguments uh, uh, on the Dobbs decision. Um, and then in Argentina, the fight is for access. And I think that will go also back to, to the question. Uh, depending on the country we're looking at, we're not only looking to change a regulation, but in those that regulation actually has changed, then we have access. And access has become an other issue because then governments are not like fully funding uh, health provisions, are not actually even like holding the health system accountable. You're just leaving it be, you know? And then we're going back to the situations where health practitioners are not supposed to be lawyers. And then what am I, you know, what can I do? What can't I do? Is, is week 14 minus plus, three days, am I allowed to go with the, with, with the service? I am not allowed to go to the service. And then we see all this, all this, uh, what, what we're seeing is like the only secure places for actually women or people who need an abortion need is actually like the, your, you know, your, your service, like your sexual and health uh, services, uh, facilities that are like, you know, like amicable to women that are sensitive to the issue that have been 
um, accompanied by organizations throughout the last 20, 30 years. So uh, we are seeing um, we, we are seeing the need for the movement to actually like you know like strengthen our um, abilities to actually hold in the places where we have moved forward, but keep pushing in those countries that we have through abortion bans and that we are seeing women, young, uh, young girl, you know, girls, but also other people who can get pregnant suffering the uh, harsh uh, consequences of uh, criminalization. Yeah, I think, um, as you mentioned, it sort of shows up the vulnerabilities at uh, the decision in the in the US shows up the vulnerabilities um, of, of other areas. Um, thank you, Catalina, very much for that. Um, Rajiv, let's let's turn to you um, to to find out the, the situation uh, in India and South Asia. Um, I remember the first time that I visited India back in 2010. I was in the New Delhi metro and I saw posters um, urging people to have small families. Uh, it was a few years later that I read um, the 1956 novel Train to Pakistan. Um, and I distinctly remember that there was a section in there that said the whole country was like an overcrowded room. What could you expect when the population went up by six every minute? That's five million every year. Um, this struck me because family planning uh, was evidently evidently a concern, you know, even 70 years ago when that novel was published. Um, so currently our, our contraception, family planning um, and abortion widely accessible. Um, in India now? And is it socially acceptable to access these services? Are they acceptable? Um, are there taboos um, surrounding it? Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me on this uh, discussion. Um, good morning and good afternoon to uh, the audience. Uh, you know, uh, India has uh, progressed a lot uh, over the last few years. Uh, we have uh, this National Family Health Survey that gives us data every five years, three to five years. And that shows that there has been a tremendous improvement in the, uh, in the, in the family planning, as well as in the uh, fertility. And even um, the, the projections that, that were published in Lancet recently, uh, that show that in 2100, uh, there will be a decline in population in India uh, rather than, so it will probably grow up to 2050, 2060, and then start coming down. And uh, out of 36 uh, states and Indian territories, there are four uh, that are, which are now over uh, 2.1, the fertility is more than 2.1, and the, all others are either 2.1 or less than that, which means they're already, uh, you know, uh, reach the replacement level fertility. So there has been a progress. There are four uh, big states, the three big states and one small, but very persistently high fertility state, uh, which need to be coming down soon. But um, I would say, uh, uh, if you're saying that if abortion is acceptable to people or the uh, or contraception use uh, is acceptable people. I would say that uh, that kind of uh, um, attitudes also have changed, right? Uh, if you if you uh, go by our paper, which we published in Lancet on the number of abortions that India have annually, is 15.6 million uh, abortions happen in India every year. So. Uh, and, and, and those people uh, are the mostly are getting the medicines directly from the chemist, uh, medical abortion pills, and having the abortion done. So there has been a lot of change and kind of research that we have been doing on abortion shows uh, that the decision making is now mostly between husband and wife. Uh, uh, because anyway, the fertility is mostly within the marriage in India. So uh, it is all between husband and wife and they don't really care what others think about abortion or their use of family planning. Yes, there are some, some pressure of having uh, children right after marriage from the family or uh, using a different contraception or something like that sometime. But those kind of things have come down drastically and that's why you see such a good progress in both family planning and the fertility in India. Um, so um, 
but uh, I just I think we were discussing about the funding and uh, and then the effect of the U.S. Supreme Court decision. I don't know whether you want me to speak about that, but uh, and I think uh, you know uh, one thing is that there have been few cases, like five to seven years, when uh, several big funders have actually quit India uh, or the SRA space. Uh, one is, of course, the UK government uh, is not funding on health anymore. Uh, and that's a, big, that's a big loss, of course. And then Buffett um, used to be giving a lot of money for abortion-related uh, activities, uh, research, and other uh, services. Buffett has recently, in the last year, uh, uh, quit India uh, and decided not to work in India. There will be a couple of uh, private uh, foundations who have also quit uh, SRA space in India for several other reasons. And one of the reasons is probably that their priorities changed. Okay, uh, but that uh, there is another factor. I would like to say that you know India has several times globally and uh, openly said that. We don't need aid anymore. We are self-sufficient. We can uh, fund our own programs and we really don't need a uh, thing. And actually the, uh, the decision by the UK government came right after such statements made by the politicians in India, uh, the very powerful politicians in India. So the parliament in UK questioned the UK government that why should we fund when they don't fund? So it's kind of, uh, you know, Mm, that kind of, uh, but some of these things come from the pride, I would say, rather than reality, uh, because once you take back the uh, funding or you withdraw the funding, there are several uh, problems that arise. Uh, in, suppose somebody has built a system uh, with a lot of years of funding, and then suddenly we withdraw, and there is no capacity, technical knowledge, or the government funding to continue that kind of services, okay? So those kind of losses are there. There has been effect. I'm giving you one example. Uh, so there was one big funding agency that used to give a lot of funding for comprehensive abortion care services. And a big NGO in India uh, with Global Link, they used to train a lot of, uh, lot of uh, providers uh, in India uh, in different states to provide abortion services. Uh, and once that uh, that funding agency withdrawn from India or uh, decided not to fund anymore in India because of the government attitudes or, or maybe not favorable attitude that they found here, they, they left. And then suddenly this big NGO is left with almost uh, very, I mean, very uh, significantly reduced fund to continue their work with the government, with the with the with training uh, providers, which will which will affect what? Which will affect the number of trained providers in the abortion uh, services uh, that are available in different states or districts, and uh, constrain the services or the access uh, for the women. So those kind of effects are definitely there. But I would end with one other effect that is a great effect that I feel because I a lot of research in this area, is that this funding agencies also bring technical assistance. They also bring fund for research. Uh, that, uh, that is to build knowledge, evidence base, and the best practices, examples uh, that can be uh, you know, disseminated and used for policy, informed policy decisions, right? Uh, and uh, if the funding agencies withdraw funding from this, there'll be lack of funding for research also. And that means, and the government does not really fund research on this kind of issues. So who will fund the research and how we build more and more evidence for informed policy decisions. So that's another loss uh, because of the uh, loss in funding that we have. But there's been a lot of uh, funding rerouting because of COVID, but we are expecting that uh, we will, uh, funding will bounce back. Uh, because of uh, because people will come back to the usual way of funding rather than funding only the COVID related activities. And then lastly, I don't think US uh, Supreme Court decision will have any effect on 
in South Asia in particular, because generally US domestic affairs do not affect our uh, decision makings or, or anything. And um, we can discuss more on that in a later segment, but uh, that's what I wanted to say right now. Thank you, thank you, Rajiv. Um, yeah, interesting point there about the effects that, um, that this might have on research and research projects um, in South Asia. Um, uh, Russia, let's, let's turn to you now. Um, so you are currently in the US, but originally from um, the Middle East. Um, uh, the Guardian newspaper in the UK um, has just reported that while abortion is technically legal in Turkey, um, in reality, these services can be all but impossible to access. Um, and at SciDevNet, we recently investigated access to cervical cancer treatment around the world. Um, and we were told by a World Health Organization, organization representative for the Eastern Mediterranean um, that women's health services are generally limited in the region. Um, for example, only nine countries offer cervical cancer screening services. Um, so just to, to get an idea of um, uh, the status of uh, sexual and reproductive health services in the Middle East, North Africa region, um, are those services equally limited? Um, and you know, are there campaigns currently to improve access to things like contraception and abortion? Yeah, um, Sophia and I have to say, I echo um, both Rajib and Catalina's conversation earlier, because actually what is happening in the Middle East is very similar to, and North Africa is very similar to what's happening, um, I would say in Latin America. And um, although it sounds like uh, Southeast Asia is doing a little bit better, um, Abortion is heavily, heavily restricted in um, Middle East, North Africa countries and um, restricted to the point of creating this climate of uh, what Catalina was speaking about, a little bit of chaos, a little bit opaque, very difficult for people to discern um, as, as individuals who might be seeking um, sexual reproductive health care services, what is allowed and what's not allowed. Um, and, and equally right, limiting what providers will um, will um, provide at the local point of contact um, and what policymakers will do at, at health um, systems levels. Um, we can't talk about the Middle East and North Africa without talking, of course, about the political instability, um, internal displacement, um, refugees, um, people who are living in extreme poverty, um, and all those groups right, of, of women and girls and people who can become pregnant are particularly vulnerable um, to this kind of opaque chaos um, where states, uh, you know, let's say the state of Lebanon or the state of Syria might not be actually providing for many of the groups that are living within their territory um, that may be either, you know, displaced from another country or internally displaced. So at the, at the heart of, of the problem of, uh, of reproductive justice in the Middle East is actually an inability for the most vulnerable groups to access safe services and sort of the further disenfranchisement of these groups. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, if uh, I worked in Palestine for many years, I, I worked in Lebanon, I've worked in Iraq. Um, if somebody has means, um, financial means um, or economic social means, that person is going to be able to achieve, um, you know, access to safe abortion, even in the most, some of the most heavily restricted and criminalized spaces by seeking out um, care from private health services or, um, as Rajiv was mentioning, people might be able to go to a pharmacy, pay a bribe, buy the medications. Um, so if people have money or an ability to travel, um, then people might be able to access abortion. And that's right, very similar to what we see in the US, um, that ultimately the people who are going to be most affected are people who are really um, restricted in social, political mobility, financial mobility. Um, you know, to Sarah's point earlier about advocating for citizens of states to sort of change policy, I think what's difficult about that in, in the Middle East and North Africa and many other regions, right, is um, is the people most affected are the people least represented um, at those uh, at those levels of, of government and government may not be interested in, in servicing that particular group. So I, I'm a OBGYN and I'm an abortion care provider. I work with Doctors Without Borders and in the context of my work with Doctors Without Borders, um, we're often, you know, servicing people, for example, Syrian refugees in, Le in Lebanon or Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. Um, or people uh, living in Gaza who may be really physically heavily restricted um, from mobility. Um, we are not receiving government funding, and so we we don't uh, we're not impacted by things like this Supreme Court decision. Um, but that's really, um, I think, a um, 
you know, a, an anomaly in terms of uh, international um, NGOs and national NGOs that might be relying on on government funds. Um, so we rely on private funds. That allows us a little bit more flexibility in the places that we work. Um, but uh, you know, more than 55% to 60% of countries in the Middle East and North Africa have heavily restricted abortion laws. Um, and, and those are laws um, right, that are based in penal code that often was instated right, in these places by colonial entities. Um, and so you can't divorce um, you know, the history of coloniality from the current restriction on uh, abortion and contraception access in these spaces. Um, and so it is not an indigenous, uh, you know, it's not an indigenous problem of, of um, trying to restrict women's uh, um, access to this very necessary health service, but it's really a vestige, I think, of coloniality. Um, there are many, many, many um, feminist movements, but also, um, as Catalina was mentioning, really allyship from other movements, right? The movements for uh, queer rights in the Middle East, the movement for disability rights, um, all coalescing around, um, you know, access to um, sexual and reproductive health care. Um, and I think, you know, it is not a, it is not a loud, right, publicly loud uh, movement, but that's because of fear of backlash, fear of uh, violence and retaliation. And so those movements are happening within these territories, really, uh, you know, <laughs> discreetly um, and subversively. And that's one of the issues with, with garnering more support and more funding is, you know, if you're not able to be very public about it, it's difficult to get some of that um, other internal or external support. Um, yeah, I could I could talk for, for so long, um, but I will. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I, I um, lived and worked in Lebanon for some time, and that was my understanding also, was that, that the conversations were happening, but they happen quietly. They have been yeah. not so not so publicly, although um, there have, of course, been recent political events that have been very public. Um, so I wonder, you know, do, do, do events like that kind of in any way, do you think embolden um, the, the, the movements that are happening more quietly traditionally? Yeah, I mean, one of the things we saw in Lebanon was, um, you know, and, I'll, and I'll, I usually, I'm using Lebanon as an example, but not, not to isolate it in, in any way. And of course, the Middle East, North Africa are very heterogeneous, right, with different types of um, governments, populations, political instability. But, but what's happening in Lebanon, sort of the protests against the state, um, really involved a lot of, uh, of, uh, of consolidation and camaraderie uh, across many different sort of intersectional uh, movements, right? The, the anti-racist movement in Lebanon, the pro- um, you know, uh, queer and LGBTQA movement, um, the pro-refugee um, immigrant movement, um, and all those people actually came together in, in public protests in the street, right, against the state, um, also advocating for reproductive rights. Um, it's interesting, and I, I bring up Lebanon as an example because I think it's one of those states where sex um, as a tool for uh, you know, political control has been very clear um, and, and very obvious. You know, sex is used uh, to differentiate who um, who gets citizenship, who gets inheritance, who gets uh, land, and um, and so the state I think is heavily invested in keeping that um, that system in place. Um, and of course, it's a system that parallels right the caste system in India. It parallels um, the <laughs> racist system in the U.S. Uh, so there are many other uh, parallels for sure. Um, but I do think I think it's both emboldening people to 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 come together and to also um, give cover to right because I think when it is difficult to come out as a um, a, a pro reproductive justice activist in the Middle East, but maybe if you're doing it within the context of other uh, other movements, you have some form of protection. Um, the bottom line, though, is is you know abortion and and contraceptive access is heavily limited, restricted. Um, providers are very afraid of, of providing the care. And so there's loss of skills, loss of facil safe facilities to, to, have, um, to have it done. In fact, what we're seeing in Turkey and Egypt is also, for example, restrictions on the medications that are used for abortion that are also used for the management of postpartum hemorrhage, uh, so, so excessive bleeding after birth. Um, and so there are implications to the restrictions um, that also have to do with you know, morbidity and mortality um, from childbirth, even in folks who want to continue pregnancies, right, who want a, a birth, um, those people's lives are also in danger because that medication might be restricted in, in the area that they're getting care. So I think there are far reaching uh, implications and, um, and only right implications that are increasing morbidity and mortality.
Mm, yeah, yeah, that's um that's a really important point. Um, thank you, Rasha. And Martin, thank you for waiting so patiently there. Um, uh, Rashi uh, just mentioned there um, uh, the, the colonial influence. Um, Sierra Leone has recently backed a bill to legalize abortion to overturn what was a colonial era law. Um, that law is expected to be submitted to parliament in September and it should be passed by the end of the year. Um, uh, I've seen um, issues raised in South Africa about the international influence on um, health campaigns within um, sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, for example, apparently US funding for anti-abortion uh, anti -abortion campaign groups is, is quite prominent. Um, are sexual and reproductive health services accessible in sub-Saharan Africa and uh, how vulnerable are they to outside influence? Thank you very much, uh, Fiona, and thanks, uh, Catalina, Sarah, Timaman, Rajab, and Russia. I think I pick from where uh, Malene uh, left from. SRH services uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa are uh, largely uh, restricted, save for uh, access to quality maternal health care, which appears to be uh, generally acceptable. Uh, uh, acceptable, but the challenge then becomes the challenge of access and uh, the abilities of various uh, governments to actually offer quality maternal health care. Access to safe abortion is restricted. Access to contraceptives is restricted. Uh, access to assisted reproduction is restricted and many more. And where does the uh, restriction arise? Uh, I think one is uh, in terms of uh, what we inherited as part of our uh, legal system, the colonial lyric in uh, uh, the penal laws that restrict uh, access, uh, for example, to abortion. Uh, blanketly prohibiting abortion and only allowing it as an exception uh, uh, when uh, performed to save uh, the life of a woman and basically then restricting it as an exception and only when it is done by medical doctors. We all know that uh, healthcare is uh, primarily offered by mid-level providers. Yeah, in Sub-Saharan Africa, you only get a doctor upon referral, way up uh, the chain of uh, healthcare services. And so we have seen uh, uh, a growing trend where uh, while uh, Africa as a region has uh, overly tried to take steps, one, to have in place uh, agreements to uh, cement uh, a strong protection for reproductive health services, like uh, the regional, uh, uh, the, the, the Charter on Human and People's Rights, uh, the Maputo Protocol on Women's Rights that, uh, among others, provide for access to safe abortion uh, in various circumstances. The continental willingness exists, but the national implementation is far from that willingness. And what are the, some of the issues that then uh, lead to uh, the uh, challenges nationally uh, to uh, avail reproductive health care? We then come to uh, the conversation on opposition groups uh, that operate uh, across uh, the continent and in particular Sub-Saharan Africa. These are led by church groups. They are transnational, traversing not just the US to uh, Europe, Europe to Africa. And they use the same tactics, uh, the same tactics you see uh, uh, being deployed in the US, the same tactics being deployed in Europe are the same tactics being deployed in Sub-Saharan Africa. They work with the same groups, largely the evangelical, the church groups, uh, that they have actually morphed from just being a religious focused group, but also professional groups within those religious groups that then use tactics like litigation now in Sub-Saharan Africa to further restrict uh, access to reproductive health care. And... Uh, we have seen in the recent challenge, traditionally the challenge has been around access to uh, safe abortion, but that is growing. There is growing opposition to access to contraceptives and in particular targeting uh, adolescents. 
while that is the age group that is faced uh, by the greatest challenge, the greatest denial of access, uh, largely mostly impacted by the restrictions, we have seen opposition growing and in particularly targeting information and services uh, uh, to adolescents. And part of the reasoning uh, that they have uh, strongly used is the issue of parental consent and uh, that parents need to agree for care to be provided to minors, basically lumping uh, a 14, 15, 16, 17 year old in the same bracket as a nine or 10 year old or a five year old when it comes to healthcare. And this has then uh, led to a situation where we find that uh, even governments that have committed uh, to uh, protect uh, reproductive health care, nationally they are doing nothing or they are actually furthering the restriction. In countries uh, like uh, Kenya, for example, where, uh, as, as Malin said, you have a constitution that then guarantees access to safe abortion, you have a government that is then unwilling uh, to give life or to implement those provisions, and therefore has continued to allow opposition groups to restrict access to information, access to services, but has also condoned uh, what I would call bullying of the ministries of health to provide a fertile environment for a further restriction of access to uh, abortion, access to contraception, access to uh, assisted reproduction, and so on. So we live in an environment uh, where, uh, while we have good frameworks, they are not implemented. And when the uh, protection framework is not implemented, it means services are lacking. And uh, the services that exist are largely from the private uh, sector. It means indigent women and girls cannot access these services because they cannot afford uh, these services. But it also uh, means that uh, there is then space for position groups to continuously attempt to further restrict even the space where the private uh, care providers operate. The public se sector uh, then remains a uh, passive or non-participant in availing reproductive health care, uh, in particular access to contraception and abortion to women and girls. As I mentioned, uh, maternal health care is generally non-contentious and, accept, uh, and acceptable. But the challenge here is where the challenge comes. You realize that uh, reproductive health care is interlinked. You cannot say you are not providing uh, contraception or uh, safe abortion, and you're only providing maternal health. The net effect is there's a dearth of training, there's an unwillingness to provide care, the quality of care has gone down, and uh, in a lot of the confidential inquiries done by government, one of the reasons they find as the leading cause of maternal mortality uh, for even women who then uh, access health facilities is the quality of care but it does not come from nowhere. It is a systemic issue because there's an attempt to cherry pick which reproductive health care do we support or promote? Which one do we suppress? If the environment does not comprehensively promote access to reproductive health care, you cannot have success in one while you're trying to defeat efforts also to promote the other. Thank you, Martin. A lot of information in there. Um, interesting that you mentioned that there's um, a lot of will continentally, um, which it, it does often seem to be the case that there's quite strong pan-African movements, um, but then at the national level, um, they may not be uh, quite as much um, success within, within campaigns. We've just got about 15 minutes left now, so we've got a couple of questions that have um, come in from the audience. This first one here doesn't appear to be addressed to a particular panelist, so I will open it to the floor. This question comes from Ana Lucia Martinez, uh, who's a doctor um, of gender studies and bioethics um, in Ecuador. So perhaps um, Catalina, this one might go to, to you. Uh, she says that for the past year, I've worked with the UNFPA advocating for the implementation of safe abortion in rape cases. But one of our main problems is how physicians react towards sexual and reproductive rights. 
We've talked about funding, but what about medical education and the mainstreaming of gender and human rights approach? How is the overrule of Roe versus Wade? Uh, how will that affect already scarce education programs and strategies towards gender and sexual and um, reproductive health rights? Um, Catalina, would you like to take that question? Yeah, what Analia has, has been, is she has described another issue in the region, but it's an issue that is also linked to the same uh, groups that are opposing uh, sexual and reproductive uh, rights, um, uh, you know, like progressive regulation or even uh, service providing, is the lack of uh, sexual education um, as a mandate in our legal systems for uh, girls and boys uh, in the school system. And it's been, um, it's been quite aggressive, uh, the, the idea to prevent for such laws to even move forward. And what we're seeing is that every more so, and it has been for the past, I don't know, 200 years, uh, Catholic Church has been the main provider of, um, of um, like, you know, like and the, the way they administer, they, they work as an administrators for public schools. So in the region, regardless of like either each country's like nuances of, of the loss of that, but in any case, um, sexual education has been um, a main, very strong, um, how do we say this? Like, you know, like goal to prevent that to happening from the opposition structure. And are the same groups, the same groups who opposed to uh, sexual and, and reproductive rights, specifically abortion, contraception, and even uh, uh, IVF. So um, therefore, to what we have been seeing is also that coalition of organization and advocacy groups to actually starting every more and more coming into that group together and to ask for that call to action. Actually in Argentina, uh, the movement motto was exactly that, that what we need is um, sexual education, you know, to, to, to prevent, uh, to actually to, like, to educate ourselves, to know it, then to have access to um, uh, contraception. And when that fails, then we, want, we need abortions in order not to die. So, you know, just to understand that in the public policy scheme, this is a whole thing that comes together. Um, I remember in the Uruguay, um, in the Uruguay discussion, uh, the, that President Mojito always said, like, well, if we want to prevent abortions, if your agenda is actually to prevent people to actually get an abortion, you need to educate them first. So they make their decisions based on education, then make them, um, you know, make contraceptives accessible for free and easy, very easy uh, to, to the people who want to get it. And then when those fails or when situations happen, abortion needs to be legal and the services not mainly provided. This is actually the WHO recommendations. So it, is, it has been also very powerful in our side when we have to counteract uh, those speeches in which, say, which you know, these groups say we need to call abortions will say, okay, fine, but then why do you oppose them to sexual, uh, sexual and reproductive um, um, education in the public school system? Because then again, it hurts the vulnerable people. Private schools, they do whatever they want. You know, like if private school wants to have a comprehensive sexual education um, a program, they, they can, they can. Whereas our kids who are growing in poverty and are growing mostly like alone because parents are working, they are ed being educated by, you know, TikTok if we're lucky, you know. So therefore, uh, this is this is it's, it's it's very 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 one of our main obstacles to actually keep moving forward. Thanks, Catalina. Russia, I see you'd like to contribute to that question. Yeah, I would. I just wanted to add on the question of training to to Martin's point and to Ajib's point that about um, you know decentering physicians right from the work of, of contraceptive and abortion care because who is actually doing it often is is just the the, the individuals who are pregnant themselves um, with the assistance maybe of other healthcare workers, community health workers, midwives, nurses, uh, chemists. Um, and so this idea that Rajiv was talking about democratizing, you know, the knowledge and, and production and what's available to people, um, putting things out there, helping, escorting people and accompanying them through 
um, self-provision, whether self-provision of contraception or self-provision of abortion, I think is the way of the future rather than you know, centering physician uh, skills. Although those are of course critically important for the emergency cases, for the complicated cases, the majority of abortions right, are, are performed um, there are medication abortions are performed by the individuals themselves, you know, outside necessarily of a health facility with the accompaniment of, um, you know, health workers and the chance to, you know, access facilities if they need for, for complicated care, which is, you know, the complications from abortion, right, very, very small, very minor, very rare. Um, Thank you for that, Arsha. Um, so I think that's all the questions that we've had come in. We did have another question uh, that came from Kenya, but we did answer that um, in the course of the discussion. Um, so if we don't have any other questions from the audience, I will turn to one final question for um, each member of the panel in just sort of one, one to two minutes. I um, just wanted to ask each of you what you think can be done to um, increase access to sexual and reproductive health services around the world. Uh, this could come from a, a variety of avenues um, or what can be done to secure rights where they have been achieved. Um, perhaps some that, have, that are long standing or some that have just been achieved in the last um, year or two. Um, let's Rebecca, let's start with you. You're my bottom left. Thanks, Fiona. Um, yeah, I mean, unsurprisingly, from my perspective here in the US, the number one thing <clears throat> that we can be doing from our perspective is ensuring that we're keeping this prioritized on the federal level here in the United States in terms of our foreign assistance. Um, but above and beyond that, um, I do think this point has been made that we have ended up in a situation where because the US is such a prominent donor, um, a lot of reliance has been put on it. And I think Quite frankly, we've seen that the US is not, uh, when they wanna be a good player, they can be, they can do wonderful things, but we've also seen um, that the US can be very inconsistent and that creates a lot of problems for the sustainability of programs. So I think it's encouraging um, other donor governments as well as governments around the world to be investing in these programs at their own national and local levels is really going to be key in the long run. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, Rasha, let's turn to you now. Yeah, I think uh, I'm not gonna speak to the funding mechanisms, but, uh, although I agree very much with what's been said. Um, you know, as a, as a global population, I think what we can do is to continue the conversations to destigmatize um, sexual and reproductive health care and, and bodily autonomy and rights. Um, I think we all agree in this panel, hopefully our audience uh, about, you know, equity between female bodied people and male bodied people, um, you know, reminding societies and communities we work with that pregnancy is not a uh, generated by the person with the uterus alone, right, it's generated by um, two people, um, and that, you know, it is, it is ultimately unjust for the one person to bear the burden uh, of all the complications and implications of, of pregnancy, and therefore, uh, you know, that person needs to be able to, um, in the privacy of their healthcare experience, right, achieve the care that they want, um, whether that's a contraceptive availability, safe abortion care, um, or the care of pregnancy and childbirth. Um, you know, as a, as a OBGYN, I have to say what kills women and girls, right, is more often childbirth than abortion. Um, and so it's important to me uh, to know that people who are carrying on um, to the to the outcome of childbirth are doing so because they're choosing to do so uh, and not because they're coerced or forced to do so um, by political um, you know status or financial status or economic status. Um, and so I urge everybody to to work uh, on the destigmatization of even right this how we speak about um, sexual and reproductive health care, um, you know, the, it's taking away the myth of um, the good patient who's seeking a good abortion or who's seeking good contraception, uh, you know, from the bad patient who's um, who's seeking it for the wrong reason. So even when we speak about rape, incest, um, protection of life, you know, those are not the only instances why people might seek abortion. And I think we need to normalize all the other reasons that people do. And fundamentally, that the only person who knows the full context of their life is the person seeking that care. Um, we can't understand that as uh, health providers. We can't understand it as policymakers, as funders. Um, I think we just need to return to center the people seeking the care. 
um, medical care, right? That this is a medical act, um, medical provision, and, and everyone should be entitled to it. Um, Thank you, Russia. Um, Rajiv, what stands to you now? Yeah, um, I will. Ex I, I want to explain what uh, you know. Uh, Russia said, and 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 second to her uh, view of the stigmatization of the SRH services. Uh, that's one of the things that we need to do uh, going forward. Whether we have, um, and of course the rights, uh, these two things. But then. There are two other things I want to bring to this table. One is the quality of services where, yes, with or without funding from outside, services are being provided. But uh, one important thing is to uh, look at the quality of services because the quality of services is not good. You are back to square one. You People will not come for services. People will go for unsafe um, methods and all those things. So quality of services is one thing that I would like to um, stress on here. And the last one is that uh, to focus on adolescent and youth. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the discussion that happened before on the comprehensive sexuality education, bringing those things back into our school system, uh, whether it is private or public, everywhere we should have this uh, comprehensive sexuality, sexuality education, uh, which will prepare the young people for the future. These are the three points I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, and Martin, to you. Thank you very much. I think a few things we need to do. One, we need to secure sexual reproductive health and rights in law uh, uh, so that it is not at the whims of uh, this government or that government. We must secure uh, SRHR uh, in our respective laws to guarantee accountability of governments when they fail uh, to fulfill them. And then we need then to prioritize uh, SRHR information and services uh, in the respective uh, countries great coordination among all actors to deal with opposition, including that then uh, fuel uh, stigma and other uh, negative uh, issues that affect access to SRHR uh, services. Governments must prioritize then nationally uh, funding SRHR services. SRHR services, services should, uh, upon prioritization as uh, uh, national priorities in primary health care should then primarily be funded by national governments to the extent they can, so that the complementary effort by other development partners then gives boost to uh, a strong foundation uh, uh, led nationally. Last but not least is uh, accountability, uh, where governments then fail to uh, fulfill uh, these promises and undertaking. And Lastly, is uh, providers need to be at the forefront as champions for SRHR uh, services, information and uh, service provision. If you have providers at the center of the conversation as champions, you then deal uh, a lot with the stigma and the misinformation when providers are in the forefront. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Um, and Sarah, to you. Thank you. I think actually Martin has, has said um, very much what, what I would, uh, would, would have said. So you need law, you need policy, you need resources and coming from an accountability initiative, you need accountability systems. It, we do not lack promises, we do not lack commitments um, to achieve sexual and reproductive health and rights. What we lack is the ability to ensure implementation and ensure everybody can actually access services. So it's a really practical um, way of ensuring that services are actually available and accessible. I would say one thing that we should all be arguing for is to, is to ensure that, UA, that SRH services are included within UHC programs because once you've got SRH into UHC in every setting, then it should be available and accessible to everybody. But coming back to what's been mentioned by, by many um, people already, you know, historically we have not lacked SRH provision within um, many settings. You know, governments use 
um, family planning, they use uh, um, reproductive health to achieve both political and demographic goals and have been doing that for decades. What we absolutely have to ensure is that we do we never lose the rights based aspect of it so continuing always to push that we're not just asking for SA, srh in you in universal health coverage but srh and rights thank you sarah and catalina to take us to the finish line thank you fiona i, I just would like to add to everything that has been said because i agree with everything <laughs> is uh i've seen we have been like discussing this among the region, but after the Dobbs uh, decision and now hearing uh, all, all the amazing people here in the panel is the need for more interaction and more movements. I mean, even though each country, each region has a specific nuance, a specific situation, a specific uh, political context, there are things that have worked for other uh, countries, other region that still hasn't for some, you know, and, and, and just like, I think we have we have been saying this all, all over this time. It's like we are on a threat. We are receiving a very hard menace, and by and we have, and I think the Dobbs decision is like our best uh, sample of that of things going backwards, you know, instead of moving forward. And we need to be holding together because regardless in which latitude, which country. Who's decision maker? Which community is this happening? Is it will affect the whole world? It affects our rights. It affects uh, what we're fighting for. So um, my my invitation and and I, I have been noticing in different uh, countries Latin America has been so is look we're here to share whatever we have learned in this in this twenty plus years but we also need to learn a lot from other countries specifically access. Perfect. We have been conquering uh, legal changes but access were far from it. So we need to do that. And in countries where still regulation is needed, we have been fighting here for 20, 30 plus years. So we can also share with you what is it that has worked and hasn't worked for you. So therefore you don't need to go through that. Thank you. Thank you so much um, to all of you. I really appreciate that you took the time to come and share your expertise with us today. Thank you very much again. Take care.